Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Hello. My name is Marie. You can use all the other names too if you like. Uh, you, you might know me from the dream room that I made at Amaze with Lindsay Raymakers and Brie Code, uh, or Open Hands, a game where you could find friendly strangers at Amaze, uh, or the Throne Room Club from last year where we did graffiti in a bathroom. Uh, or you might know me from many other projects like special guests where you could book weird guests for your Zoom meetings, uh, Weird Canada, which is music stuff, drone day, online gatherings, imaginary residency, which I made with Jay Palmer, uh, or a number of experimental video games that are usually cooperative. And you might not know me at all, in which case it's nice to meet you. And um, I'm sorry, it's kind of weird that we're meeting each other by me just talking at you, but uh, I hope next time we can talk more equally. So today we're talking about a comic. Uh, this comic does not exist yet. Uh, it's pending funding uh, and I actually already started. So my hope is that the funding does come through. <laughs> and I'm working on this comic with a bunch of people, uh, with Jim Monroe from Gain, from Hanin Almir, Ermac Tanner, Christian Scott, and Michael Antorno. Uh, right now it's some of us, later it'll be many of us. Uh, and we're curious about co-ops. I mean, not just co-ops, we're curious about the different ways of organizing labor and work. Uh, unions, co-ops, traditional structures with bosses, co co structures that have, certain values, but maybe artificial formal co-ops. Uh, I'm even curious about freelancers and gig economies and all the ways that we might relate to our work. Uh, in the next year, I hope to interview people, like maybe some of the people who are listening, who are working in gang co-ops or working in co-ops from other industries or even just people who are co-op curious, uh, just interested and curious about starting a co-op. Uh, and why, why do I care about this? Um, well, on a very basic level, I care because I'm a person that works. I have worked all my life. I started my paper route when I was I don't know, six or seven years old, you know, getting up at 6 a.m. delivering papers, uh, you know, moving logs for one penny a log. I worked at Pizza Hut, Dairy Queen, convenience stores, bartending, line cook. Uh, I've worked with big corporations like CBC. I worked with SoundCloud. I've worked so much all my life. Usually I have multiple jobs. And right now I'm a freelancer, which means that I'm perpetually on the verge of burnout. And it also means that I work every day on just indescribably amazing art projects, games, consulting, community projects. Um, yeah, and I guess up beyond that, I was also born into a workers' co-op. Uh, my parents lived in a co-op when I was born and it was a little chaotic. Uh, my when I came home from the hospital, my dad had to cut a hole in the floor so the heat would come up to me. Um, so we didn't stay there that long. <laughs> but yeah, I wanted to, okay, so I want to share a few thinkers that I think are interesting when we start talking about co-ops. Uh, first of all, Eleanor Ostrom, I'm a huge fan. Uh, and so there's this idea of the tragedy of the commons that some people might know and some people might not. The idea is that if we had a pool of fish, everyone was gonna fish all the fish until there's no fish left. This was proposed by like a um, economist from Texas, uh, but Eleanor Ostrom came out and won the Nobel Prize for proving that people actually are very good at co-managing resources given certain constraints, um, which is something we would have noticed if we looked at any of the indigenous communities around the world who are doing this. Uh, but regardless, she got it all together and, and proved it in a time where people just really did not want to hear that. They wanted to hear that people are selfish and that it's impossible. 
Uh, and then I want to share this one, uh, the Comahee River Collective. Uh, so these are like legendary Black feminists doing early work about interlocking oppressions. You know, they say work must be organized for the collective benefit of those who do the work and create the products, not for the profit of the bosses. And they also had, a, I mean, they did a lot of amazing work, but they had a famous quote around if Black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all systems of oppression. Uh, yeah, so early amazing co-op people. Wow, slides. I just wanna click onwards. Let me move onwards. I think I have to like click outside of anything. Okay, yeah. And then Joe Freeman, uh, we can't really talk about co-ops without bringing up Joe. Uh, who talked a lot about structurelessness. So if you've ever lived in a shared house and no one did the dishes, or if you've ever lived in, I don't know, a punk squat and seen how even when there's no structure, there is structure. Uh, Joe Freeman talked about that uh, a lot, uh, about how we have to make power dynamics like explicit and clear, or else like, they tend to reinforce in the way that they already were. And it's like basically impossible to challenge them. So yeah, why are we here? We're here to say, can you make a co-op with your friends? Uh, yes, you can. Um, should you? I don't know. I mean, this is something that I'm curious to explore. Uh, I'm hoping co-ops are good because I don't think my mental health can take any more disappointments in this life. <laughs> but I'm also like not here to prove anything. I'm, I'm co-op curious. And I was gonna sidebar into video games here because whenever you search for video game co-ops, you get into co-op video games, which actually has interesting parallels, but maybe this is for another time. Uh, so yeah, I wanna talk about, can you make a co-op with your friends? And just briefly, like what is a co-op? Um, is it a business that's owned by the workers? So it, there's lots of different types of co-ops. There's lots of different things going on, but definitely it means that the profit is owned by the workers, hopefully and also that the decisions are owned by the workers. Uh, that's complicated. Maybe we'll talk about it with our friends in a minute. Uh, it seems a little bit strange to me always that the business would be owned by anyone but the workers. Like that sounds very counterintuitive. And even ownership itself seems strange. Like I understand the concept of abundance. So if I found $20 on the ground and then I bought pizza and I said, here's pizza for everyone this would make sense to me. But the idea that like, because I found $20 on the ground or because I had like specific circumstances that made it easy for me to do things that I get to reap the benefits or own anything beyond my own existence feels very strange. Um, but anyway, this idea that we know what we need, we, you and me and whoever else that we choose in our co-op, we know what we need and we can work together to reach our goals. And if we don't know what we need, we can figure it out. I mean, this is kind of a basic principle of co-ops and I think it's wonderful. Uh, also just like a, one final pitch. I mean, one thing about a co-op is that you get to make your own decisions about things like hustle, um, creepy dude bosses. I mean, it doesn't have to be a dude, creepy bosses, racist bosses, like the precarity of employment. You can have a kind of like more control and transparency around that. Uh, and also the survival rate of co-ops is really high. Um, the studies show people are happier, better survival rates. I mean, I'm not going to go into the bad parts because I think we're going to talk to some people about the biggest challenges of co-ops. But one thing I will mention is that MasterCard was originally a co-op. <laughs> and, and that depending on how you organize money and control, it's possible to have a co-op that's very exploitative. Um, it's, I mean, it's inside us, these kinds of systems of exploitation sometimes. So what I want to do now is call up some people. Uh, we've had this brief conversation. I'm a little worried that the sound is not going to work because of our problems earlier, but we're going to find a way. Uh, so I guess I need to see. Okay, so I'm going to open up Discord. There's this thing in talks where it's like, you're the speaker, you know what's up, you have all these ideas because you're a fully formed magical being giving some kind of manifesto. And I know that's not the amazed way, and it's also not my way. Uh, everything that I know comes out of relationships. So I thought it'd be fun to call up some friends and ask them about their experiences with co-ops. So we're gonna start right here. I really hope you can hear them. I'm gonna check the chat to see if people can hear. Can you hear the phone ringing? Oh no. 
Hey, welcome. You're first, and I'm not sure that the sound is working. So I'm going to pull up your video so people can see it. And then I'm going to make sure that your sound is working um, <laughs> before I ask you any questions. Here you are. And let's check the speakers. Everyone, welcome backstage. I'm checking in the backstage to see if you can hear both of us. Hello. Okay, we see typing. Just me. This was my biggest nightmare. Look at this. Everyone look, it's an interactive talk. So we've got Lou back. Let's check. We have Discord. And we see nothing coming from Discord. Never fear. Okay, and we're gonna go into settings. We're gonna go into voice and video. And let's try this. Can you try again? Say something? Check, check, check. Can you hear me? Maybe we'll have a bunch of feedback. Did you hear that? Okay. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Oh, no. I see typing. No, just me. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and share again uh, with audio. It's a less beautiful audio, uh, but at least it'll be audio. Okay. Do I need to do anything? No, you get to just be. <laughs> yeah. Okay, share screen. Share the correct screen. Share. There you are. Oh, one more time. I feel like there's something poetic and beautiful about this trouble with Zoom setup. No matter how professional you is, no matter how many years of a pandemic it's been, we're still here. Okay, can you hear now? Should I say anything? Yeah, you should say things. Hello, hello. Jane. Yeah, okay. It's very low. Um, but that's kind of what we expected. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you so much for coming. And what I'm gonna do is I'll write down what you say and make sure to repeat it in case people can't hear you. So I, I was calling, you know why I'm calling. I'm calling because I wanna know about what are the hard parts of co-ops and like how, does, how do co-ops intersect with capitalism? Yeah, um, so I think it's interesting because uh, co-ops and startups, this is something my friend Joaquin de Plan always used to say, and when they first start out, they're really similar, right? Like a startup or a game studio and a co-op are pretty much the same thing because it's just a bunch of people wearing a bunch of different hats. Everyone's really heavily involved in decision-making. Um, and so they tend to operate very similarly. The difference comes when things change and when money gets introduced, when things grow or if there's success or if there's uh, money on the table. And that's where they divert, where startups basically have generally one or two owners who are concentrating all the power decision making and are able to profit off of that influx and make decisions that harm the initial employees who are being exploited versus co-ops where everyone is sharing in that and has the the power to sort of uh, decide how to use that money or use those opportunities in ways that they see fit. Um, but the complication comes when things that have, like we've seen at Co-op is that as we've grown, the way we've structured ourselves has to have changed. So we have to learn new ways to structure ourselves and new ways of co-op organization and management to account for the fact that we've grown as a team. Uh, we are 11 owners now instead of, you know, what we started with as like three or four people. And uh, there's a lot of oversight and overhead that has to be accounted for while also still making games and being very nimble in the game making process. So how do you have this organizational structure that allows for games to continue to be made uh, really smoothly and while still taking care of the co-op 
and the overall responsibility that everybody uh, owes. So that's that's something that I think that we've been, uh, it's a challenge that we've been dealing with. And the way that we've structured ourselves now is we still have a full ownership executive committee, but we break into working groups um, to do things for the co-op in more nimble ways. So we have like a socials working group, we have a financials working group, we have a HR working group. And those are made up of three, two or three people. And those folks are fully empowered to make their own decisions in those working groups without getting, you know, full approval from the rest of the co-op. And then in our quarterly general meetings, we have four meetings a year where everyone comes together. They present the work that they've been doing, get any approval that they need and um, uh, organize the next working groups that might be necessary. And what we found is that this is really great for us, but it does take a lot of emotional and like it just takes time, you know, it takes effort. And when you're in game development and you're very stressed out about time, uh, it can be really hard to uh, self direct with those working groups. So we're finding ways to like address that and, uh, you know, create mandatory minimum volunteer hours, things like that uh, to enforce sort of like the emotional upkeep of the studio as a as a co-op as a unit to make sure everybody's as involved as they can be while not detracting from our timelines for making games i'd say that's probably our biggest challenge one of the hardest things that we've had to navigate as a co-op as we've grown in size and in responsibility and as we've had more money to deal with and make decisions with it's about making sure that um we're still challenging our power structures internally and making sure that people are as engaged and as um, present as they can be and that the process of organizing the co-op allows different types of people to be as involved as possible. Thank you so much. We're gonna talk more soon. Uh, I really appreciate it. Also, thank you for being the tester of this strange audio Absolutely. experience. <laughs> Absolutely, I hope, I hope that all makes sense. It helps so much. Okay, talk soon. All right, bye. bye. Okay, okay, so our sound system is not ideal. But I also think it's good to see how this works. I mean, I think it's normal for things to be a bit broken. Um, but let's try a different one for this one. Okay, we're gonna try this. All right, hey. So our sound is kind of broken. Oh, here's me. <laughs> oh, this is fun. This is way better. Can you say something? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. And probably it's going to be better than the last one. Uh, so thanks for taking my call. <laughs> if you'd like to introduce yourself and, and tell us about what is the hardest part of running a co-op for you? Uh, sure. sure. I mean, I... I don't know if I should introduce myself first. Yeah, yeah, you should introduce yourself, yeah. please. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. No, no worries. <laughs> My name is Pablo, and I'm part of uh, Matajuegos, which is an indie game co-op in Argentina. Um, and we were collective for a very long time before being a co-op, and we've recently made the, the changeover. And like any collective, I think, uh, when it came time for us to, to gain legal personhood, um, co-ops were very attractive for all the reasons people might know, you know, ideologically, the idea of it being democratic and a horizontal structure where there are no bosses, where everyone is an owner, collective owner of the, of the co-op, uh, seemed very similar to how we ran the collective. Um, and, uh, and the things we, we perhaps weren't as aware of because we were very, very, focused on this very anti-capitalist uh, conceptualization of the co-op, which, which it is, it is a, it is a, it is a structure that, that opposes capitalism or the way it, it tends to work. The thing we weren't aware of necessarily or weren't focusing as much on was that at the end of the day, just because we own the company doesn't mean it's not a company. And as a company, uh, that means we were responsible for a lot of administrative work legally responsible for a lot of administrative work that as a collective, we didn't really have to think so much about because we were amorphous, dynamic, always shifting in our organization. And uh, suddenly we had to do a lot of uh, bookkeeping, tax work, like with a lot of accountants, 
and deal with you know the the nastier side of the business that perhaps we we didn't want to think about all so much before um and i think it, that's that's especially if you come from uh from um an art or video game uh, what's work practice um and you're not you've never done administrative work for a business or a company it can be quite a lot to take on very quickly if you're if you're dropped into the deep end of that and you have no training so that's something to be aware of before you start a co-op as opposed to after you start a co-op um and the second thing i think is um once you you're engaged in that horizontal democratic structure within your co-op um and everybody legally has the same the same voice and the same vote in how decisions are made and there are no bosses suddenly power dynamics which you thought about in a certain way uh, uh which you thought about in a legal perhaps way in a, in a bureaucratic way suddenly become social power dynamics which you have to you have to engage or be aware of if you want things to truly be equitable for everyone um you know even in an ideal situation where there's no one trying to co-op power or amass power it's hard uh just because we're very busy people for everyone to get the chance and the time to participate equally and for decision making not to fall into the few into the hands of few people who have the time and the predisposition to engage with that there's a lot of work that needs to happen uh in communicating in communication between everyone uh, in making sure that everyone has the time and the, and the knowledge and the information they need to be involved in the decision making process. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of effort, that's a lot of time, that's a lot of work that needs to go into it, which again, isn't, isn't the time and the work that you're, that you're putting into whatever you're making, into the video games you want to produce, into the art you want to make. Um, and, it's, and it's vital for a democratic and horizontal system to work for that communication to be ever present and for you to truly make sure that people can be engaged in that or if they can't be engaged with that to know what they are delegating to be fully aware of what they're delegating to others mm -hmm. um, and every co-op is different every co-op has different ways to make that work in different committees and different structures and it changes a lot country to country but that communication at the end of the day needs to be there for for anything that's democratic or horizontal to work and for everyone to be engaged and coming from a collective that's not always that might seem easier than it sounds that might be easy and uh, and sometimes it's not and it's one of the growing pains of of coming into a co-op and trying to and trying to make things work forever it doesn't sound easy to me thank you so much I'm there's like there's me here and then me in there and then you there. Um, thanks for your um thanks for your answer. And we're gonna talk more soon, uh, hopefully under less like technically stressful circumstances. <laughs> I'm holding up my phone, but I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much, Pablo. Bye. Okay, this is going great. Okay, two more calls. This is for real how I do all the things. Here, let's quickly try. Okay. Here we go. I'm a bit late on this call, so <laughs> is it working? Oh, it's loading. Yes. Hey. Hello. Hey. You're uh, you're live on a maze. Thanks for taking my call. Problem. I hope everyone's having a good time at the festival. I saw some group painting did you did you say group paintings i did not see that but i'm very curious yeah yeah i think alistair was running some kind of uh, painting thing anyway oh is it still loading that's so strange that makes sense um well welcome jess if you'd love to if you'd like to introduce yourself uh you can and then i just have one question for you about co-ops sure thing uh so i'm jess rowan marcotte uh i am one third of the Soft Chaos Cooperative, uh, and I like to make games that uh, make people think about their connections and uh, vulnerability and awkwardness. That's a beautiful introduction. I keep wanting to turn the phone. To see. <laughs> I'm sure I could do this with better uh, settings. Um, yeah, I'm calling because I'm really curious about the hard part 
of co-ops? Like where it goes sideways, what's difficult? Uh, what's been difficult for you? Yeah, uh, so the thing that I have noticed is that everywhere that you go, there's a different legal definition of a co-op and they're very poorly understood as a structure. So people think things like co-ops can't be for profit. So that makes them difficult to invest in, but it's not the case. Or co-ops, uh, like, yeah, the legal status is, is very is very different from place to place, which makes it difficult to share information across borders uh, and difficult to, to understand the co-op's place in terms of grants or uh, similar, similar eligibility questions all the time. And uh, nobody, nobody seems to know the right information for us. So that's the hardest part, I would say. Thank you so much, Jess. I love hearing from you. I call you all the time about everything I work on, basically. So I'm really appreciative. <laughs> and I'll, I'll probably call you again soon. Uh, uh, have a good one. And I uh, hope that all the other folks have very interesting ways of answering these cool questions. Thanks, Jess. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. bye, -bye um, I would like it to be known that we did test this sound thing three different times yesterday and then also before the talk. <laughs> okay, one more call, it's our last one. Oh no, this is a, oh wait, if I do this. So I think we want it to be. We'll see how it's going. Oh, hey. Hey. Um, wait, I have to flip the camera so the people can see you and you can see the people. How's that? Oh, there Amazing. we go. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Where are you right now? Um, I'm on the New Jersey Turnpike. Um, I think I just landed in New Jersey now. But I'm, I'm going back to New York. Oh, that's exciting. Um, thanks for taking my call. I'm wondering if you would introduce yourself briefly so people can know who you are. And then uh, I have one question for you. Sure. Um, thank you for letting me join you. <laughs> and my name is Xing. I am um, I'm an artist and I make all kinds of stuff. But most recently, I've been making a, a very strange um, communication software to answer some of my deepest confusion around communication and working with people and um, trying to figure out what other forms of, you know, collaboration and facilitation can exist in a, in a software space. So, yeah, I, I think that's kind of how I'm summing up. I'm so glad I asked. I mean, I can introduce you, but then I never learn anything new. Um, I'm so glad to know you. And yeah, I'm calling, I'm just curious about your opinion on co-ops and collectives and like working with people. Like, do you, is that something that works for you? What do you think about them in general? Um, I think co-ops specifically, um, to me feels like a really good beginning to think about alternatives to, you know, running a company or, yeah, like kind of like a more conventional forms of um, generating any more profit. Um, Co-op is interesting because it's actually quite historical and, um, you know, a lot of co-ops are actually for profit, which is not necessarily a bad thing depending on what, you know, what the dynamic or, or what the context is right so i think that um one of the you know i, I guess why i said that oh, i think that was a very good beginning because i i think you know i see a need for that you know um right now especially like through the pandemic um but also um i i think there is a, a potential pitfall too with co-op because because it does still have to survive and exist under this um you know, greater profit-driven um, society. So, so what the, the kind of people that can happen is when when a co-op has to sustain, sustain itself and still have to make decisions that are 
um, impacted by the market or, you know, sometimes, sometimes when it comes to like a group of people coming up with solutions together, like even the idea of solution, a lot of time um, is, you know, it, it, oftentimes people would, would retreat to, to uh, solutions that have already precedences and solutions that have already exist. And a lot of times it can be very capitalistically, capitalistically driven, right? So, so I think, um, Uh -oh. But it's really um, hard to kind of, well, it's not hard, it's, it just takes a lot of mindfulness to kind of like, like create the kinds of space that can move at the speed of trust, right? Like a lot of Adrian Murray Brown, that, that was her quote. <laughs> um, and, and what that really means, like within a, a context of, you know, running a co-op, needing to sustain certain things, needing to provide certain things. So yeah, I guess that's that's the co-op answer. But um, what was what was the other part? No, I loved it. I don't know. I think we should stop at Adrian Marie Brown and the speed of like I just feel like that is the most beautiful way to end. Um, I'm gonna call you more and we're gonna talk more soon about this, but thank you so much. I loved it. And uh, everyone should look you up and look up your work. I'll put it in the chat. Um, <laughs> Um, thanks for having me. Um, Have a great rest of your day. Okay. Thank you so much, Fashion. Um, okay, that's it. We've been through all the chaos of sound. We've called so many people. Uh, I'm going to go to the thank you slide. <laughs> and just thank you all also. I mean, I, I think there's something really interesting about not pretending like not pretending things are complicated things are hard it doesn't matter how much you test or like what kind of systems or world you build um there's always this complexity and i think the impulse to make co-ops comes from this other space of being like i am part of community i am not independent from anything i everything that i do everything that i have everything that i make is part of everyone else uh, and I'm grateful for my friends and colleagues for having the patience to do these strange sound calls with me. Um, yeah. And I'm actually like as one final thing, I don't know, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do this because there's always so much like sound chaos. But for each phone call I made, I'm going to plant one seed. Um, I, have a whole, I brought out all my seeds. It's, it's a lot of seeds. And, uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna plant peas. Yeah, Don't know what it is. <laughs> Marie, what was this? <laughs> hey, hey. hey. Yeah, stop sharing, maybe. You, you, you showed, showed us something. What was it? Yeah, I'm gonna show you. I'm just gonna stop sharing so I can be big. And then I'm just gonna. What are we looking at? These are all my seeds. Oh. Wow. Where do you find yeah. the seeds? I find them often from plants. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I go to plants and I take them. <laughs> <laughs> the seeds come from the last seeds. Mm -hmm. Also in my local library, there's like a seed trust. So you can get seeds as long as you promise to bring back seeds for other people. Okay. Ah. Yeah, seeds Is there also seeds from Berlin? Yes, Yeah. I do. I have many generation seeds from like example the peas that i grew in berlin they're called mm. oh, here's one it's sweet peas berlin pea harvest <laughs> pea harvest berlin that's it oh wow wonderful. cool that's so cool <laughs> <laughs> i'll plant these ones i'll plant these amazed berlin peas i often sprout them first but not today are you spreading them yeah, I often sprout them. So I put them in a wet paper towel in a bag and then I let them sprout first. But with these ones, I'm gonna take a risk. I'm just gonna go straight into the dirt with them. Um, so I'll show you. I'm gonna go straight into this. Oh, okay. Yes. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for, for, for this uh, um, great idea of co-op. I was actually thinking myself about co-op because uh, my friend Nico, you also know Nico, right? Uh, from from yeah. Orange Spray. And um, 
he told me as well, hey, you have to think different, you know, you can't do this with a GH, uh, GmbH, uh, you know, this amazing thing, you have to go into co-op. And I, I just realized, I mean, it's pretty hard to actually change your mind somehow. I mean, uh, of course, I mean, it's ideal to do something for the community, to do something with the community together. I try to do this now with the Amaze space and so on. But somehow, because I was sometimes was being part of associations and I don't like so much this kind of constantly conversations. This is something what makes me, and nobody wants to take the risk, nobody wants to be responsible, nobody wants to take decisions. And it's just a collective decision, which is fine. I definitely understand, and it's, it's probably this is probably this will cure, and this will bring world peace and so on. But I don't know. I'm 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 thinking still different. I mean, for I, I'm I'm feeling different. Let's say this. So <laughs> this is a, yeah. It's just my 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 seat to this. Lost your sound. 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 <laughs> Lost. <laughs> no. <laughs> there you go. There you are. This is going to work. Yeah. Goodbye, microphone. Um, Sorry for being honest. No. Please be honest. Let this world be more honest and authentic. Uh, no, no. I, I just wanted to say I went to a lot of music festivals when I was a kid. I was around a lot of hippies. And I saw sometimes the 10 hour meetings where everyone said everything. <laughs> it was like, we're gonna build consensus and it was never ending. So I, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, but uh, how can you actually speed something like that up? Because I mean, the idea is cool. The so idea is cool. I think small is important. Small is important. Right. I mean, I also understand that, I mean, I, I know I've heard from a company, for example, I think, I don't know if it's Silicon Valley or wherever it was, um, they also have the, the CEO and everybody earns the same money. So there is no discussion. Mm -hmm. Everybody earns whatever, what they need, $50,000 or $100,000 they earn or something like that. And nobody is under pressure, you know, everybody has a good lifestyle, everybody can work fine. So of course, I mean, it's a kind of a startup and, uh, but it's also a mentality, you know, I think I like this idea. Um, so that everybody is kind of, yeah, it's a family, I'm part of it, you know, I'm, yeah. I own something and uh, I, I got my money for what I do. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm a freelancer or even when I have a company, I'm a freelancer, you know, I have try to survive and um, but it would be cool to when I, when there would be money and income whatever a few millions to give uh, um, then everybody the same share and this is something for me as well kind of co-op right I mean having this kind of yeah there is no hierarchy there is no boss and I mean this is also what is part of your title I don't know if uh, it was uh, also part of the conversation yeah 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 no no boss <laughs> I do. I mean, I love this idea of everybody taking care of. Um, I, I talked to a friend. I worked on a project recently with a friend, and he has a co op. And their thing is uh, when they make money, some money goes into the co op, and then everyone gets paid a base wage every month. And if you make more than your base wage plus what you pay into the co op, then you keep the rest. But like you, everyone pays in and everyone gets paid out. Everyone gets taken care of if you have a dry month or a hard month. Um, but how big uh, is, is the ideal group then? Small, I think. Like, Small, I don't know. two, three? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, three. But then we four, are talking, five. but this, this is something what, yeah, this is something what could work, yeah. Yeah. Nice. But yeah, it's not easy. And then like, I don't know, you're still existing in capitalism. Like you're still competing against other companies you still have like the pressure if you have poor social safety nets like in berlin if you get sick i don't know it feels like there are good safety nets in berlin and like germany compared to let's say the states um and in canada is better than the states too but uh like there's a lot of pressure on a on a co-op in a country that doesn't have a lot of social support to be all those things for everyone yeah 
But imagine just being with your friends every day and never being like being a boss is hard, right? To make a lot of decisions, you got to sign all the checks. It's like imagine not having to be the boss and also not having to have a boss. It'd be cool when there's always a rotation, you know. Everybody is mm -hmm. not not a boss, but it. Uh, I think it was I was listening about somebody's take care of accounting, somebody's taking care of whatever yeah. this kind of. Uh, 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 development or if it's business development or create creative development um but it would be cool when everybody circles you know i, I don't yeah. know if this is good for the co-op or also for the whatever idea what they want to um, bring out so you want to do accounting i always do accounting <laughs> i hate it but I, I have to do it because i i can't pay anyone to do that so i wish <laughs> i had somebody who's doing all this accounting for me and the company yeah, this was a big thing for Joe Freeman is, is rotating tasks. So nobody kind of like gets centralized, like nobody has all the control over the money because then you have too much power. So for a while you're in charge of accounting, then you teach someone else. And then for a while they're in charge of accounting. Actually, what, what has this all to do with games and playful media? Yeah, yeah. What does this have to do with games and playful media? Yeah, yeah. What are we talking well, about? Well, okay, so I think it has two things. <laughs> I think it has two things to do definitely with games and playful media. Hold on. I'm going to make you come out of my speakers, hopefully, so I don't have to hear my own voice echoing back, <laughs> which is one of the things. Okay, so two things. One, games are part of the economy. Even artists, like every artist, every freaky weirdo artist is still part of all of this. Some people are like trust fund kids, so they can just support themselves in that way. Some people have like tech implications. Like when I lived in Berlin and I worked at SoundCloud and that support, I worked one day a week and it supported me through my other work. Um, some people are just like willing to take a risk or have risk or family inheritance, but like all of us who make beautiful art, let's say we all make beautiful art, we're all part of this. We're all making decisions about how we make our money and how we relate to our, our art, which is work. So that's one thing. And the other thing is I think games, people who make games probably have very interesting opinions about designing things, designing a business, designing the way we make decisions, the way we share money. Like I think people who make games have interesting thoughts about this. Yeah. yeah. And you were speaking to uh, game people just now, right? We, who you called, like from Argentina, um, Pablo. Yeah. So they are also, you know, working in co-ops uh, around the world. So, you know, it's part of our industry already. Yeah, yeah. Good and to know. And it's growing. I mean, people are very interested. Um, so like Salim runs, or runs, I mean, it's like, that's funny. That's funny. That's like a default. Salim works uh, at co-op uh, Montreal Game Studio. Uh, Jess just founded a new co-op with a few other people, uh, um, a, like playful media co-op. Uh, and Pablo runs a co-op, well, as you know, is, is a nominee. I don't know, maybe one, who knows? Uh, and Shin is doing interesting work related to like playful media and online spaces. Uh, so this this is a theme, like people are excited about this. People are talking about this. Um, when I was doing research last year for a different thing, 